Hello world. What's up everyone? Welcome back to Ace. I am your host, Darren Joe. Thank you for being here. It's a once in a lifetime event that we're going through now with COVID-19. And uh, my thoughts are with all of you who are listening around the world. And, you know, I'm not one to lecture, but I think now is the time to do our best to take care of ourselves and to take care of others the best we can. And that's all we can do at this stage. So I'm wishing you all well. Last year, when I started inviting guests to the show, I invited my old friend, Dr. Stephanie Berg, who is a naturopathic doctor, to talk about her journey changing professions from being a business lawyer to now a naturopathic doctor. We also discussed naturopathic principles and how we can use those to manage stress, sleep better, have better nutrition, and manage our behavior and a whole variety of health-related issues and tips that can help those of us working on our own maintain optimal health, right? So we can do our best work. But of course, with the coronavirus, I had to bring Stephanie back on the show to give us some tips for how we can strengthen our immune system during this time. So the first 10 minutes of the show are devoted to Dr. Stephanie giving us some very practical ways we can strengthen our immune system. And then in part two, we move to our original interview, which was talking about um, Stephanie's journey from lawyer to naturopathic doctor, principles of naturopathic medicine for optimal health, and so forth. I did ask Stephanie for some advice on how to maintain and boost testosterone um, as an aging male, hate to say that, but it's true. So if you wanna stick around for that part of the conversation, um, I included that as a bonus section at the very end of the episode, the last 10 minutes. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm always excited when I see friends who are excited about the work they do, and I'm just thrilled that Stephanie has found something she's so passionate about, and that just fills me up with, with a lot of happiness, and um, I hope this show helps you guys do the same thing. All right, so let's get to my chat with Dr. Stephanie Burke. So Stephanie, since the last time we talked, uh, there's th been this crazy coronavirus, COVID-19. A lot of people are, you know, obviously stressed out, but we have to do our part, right, to keep our immune system strong. So I wanted to get you back on the show, you know, really quickly to talk about, you know, what are some naturopathic ways or any tips you have to help us stay healthy, keep our immune system strong in the face of this virus? No, definitely. Um, well, naturopathic medicine is a great way to start. And like we discussed it before, but I think I'll just mention it briefly in case this is going to be at the beginning, like you said, I think we should focus first on the lifestyle stuff that everyone can do to keep the immune system strong. Well, of course, want to follow all of the recommendations from the CDC or the government, wherever you're located. So social distancing, really important. Practice good hygiene. Wash your hands for 30 seconds with soap and water. Hand sanitizer if you can't wash your hands and make sure the alcohol dries. It has to be 62% alcohol. So all of the usual stuff. Um, and that's just to in avoid infection and avoid infecting others um, because, like we're learning, many people, especially children, can be asymptomatic. So we want to make sure we're not infecting other people, spreading it further, um, and protecting those who are at risk. And yes. But in terms of supporting the immune system, so just starting off with sort of the let food be thy medicine approach and eat whole nutrient dense foods, whatever dietary approach you follow, it doesn't matter. Everyone agrees on eat real food. So our immune system relies on nutrient dense whole foods to function well. So it's really good idea to avoid the processed foods and cut out the sugar. So now has never been a better time for to reduce the junk food and the processed food. All of that is, you know, I went down the aisles at the grocery store and 
all of the junk food was gone. And I was like, no, people take the, take the nutrient and stuff. But, um, anyways, uh, you know, sugar can suppress the immune system. So limit those processed foods, limit the high fructose corn syrup, the cookies, the cakes, that sort of stuff. Whole fruit is wonderful. You don't need to avoid fruit, you know, whole fruit, but the processed foods. I would also, in terms of diet, make sure you're getting adequate pro- adequate protein. So it, again, whatever diet you follow, make sure you are eating adequate amounts of protein that's critical for immune function and making the, the immune cells. So even if you're a vegan or a vegetarian, there are great plant-based proteins, beans, legumes, nuts, seeds, tempeh, organic and you know GMO if you can get it. So those are some wonderful things. And another diet, diet trick, add garlic, onions, ginger, all sorts of spices to the diet. They're very antimicrobial, especially like onions, garlic. So I prefer, let's start with food, um, oregano, turmeric, rosemary, because it gets tricky when you're making recommendations for herbal supplements to a large group of people. And I hesitate to do that because they can have interactions with drugs. Even simple things like zinc can make um, certain antibiotics not work well or diuretics or we don't want pregnant women to take. uh, There are lots of herbs that they shouldn't be taking or higher doses of vitamins and minerals. But everyone can add these great antimicrobial garlic, onions, those sorts of things to food, herbs and spices. And eat multiple servings of a colorful array of fruits and veggies. So those are all going to be high in your phytonutrients and your vitamin C, A, all those great things that support the immune system. So just get, try to eat the rainbow basically. Um, and not in Skittles, but in fruits and vegetables. So try to get every color of the rainbow daily fermented foods. You're and, and sort of, they're almost in every culture that we find. So your sauerkraut, kimchi, um, natto, miso, tempeh, even unsweetened yogurts, k- kefir, great sources of fermented foods. And those support the microbiome and have been shown to be helpful for immunity. I would also say drink plenty of fluids. So especially warmer fluids, it, it basically supports your body's functions, including the immune system. And generally you hear recommendations about drink half your body weight in water, but you know, make sure it's appropriate for what your certain condition, if you may require more or less, depending on your current health situation. I would also say soups and broths are wonderful. So you can add fresh, fresh veggies and certain beans or protein sources. And then herbal teas are also a great way to get things in and keep bottled water, filtered bottled water with you. Um, everyone is scrambling to get bottled water But, you know, the tap water is still going and you can buy a filter and then you always have great filtered water. But also when it's warm and toasty indoors, it usually dries out the the mucous membrane. So it makes it easier for virus viruses to attach. So I would say just, you know, make sure that you keep your your mucous membranes moist. Whoa, whoa. how do we keep our mucous membranes moist? (laughs) So hydration, just hydration in general is wonderful. I'm talking about your like your nasal passages, your throat, anything where, you know, that's where we're getting the viruses, right? So keep things moist. Um, Also sufficient sleep. Very, very important. We know sleep is restorative. It heals the body. It, you know, uh, decreased sleep can impair the immune system. So I say aim for seven to eight hours a night um, and, and rest and relaxation, reducing stress because stress will also impair the immune system. And, um, so it's important to stay calm. I know everyone, we're all, we're all, this is an anxiety producing time for everyone. And we've never, you know, it's a historic moment, something that we're all just going through the first time. We don't know a lot yet. We're learning things all the time. Things are changing. So, Sorry, that was stress-inducing when I said it. <laughs> so really important to stay calm and stress-free as best you can, being around people, laughing. People are being so creative on Facebook now. Like, go watch it. Go see a funny Facebook post. Um, get regular exercise. So we want mild to moderate exercise, like 30 to 40 minutes. To It's actually good. will help the, the immune system. And if you can get outside, even better, a little vitamin D. Vitamin D is really important for the immune system. But um, I would also say avoid over-exercising, like training for endurance events, 
it can cause you to feel run down, can lower immune defenses. So just a good amount of physical activity. Don't overdo it, but get your physical activity in. Um, and I know, Darren, you're a fan of meditation and yoga and all that sort of thing. That's really wonderful for stress reduction and, you know, all sorts of all, uh, many benefits beyond that. But um, I'm also sort of jealous because I don't have the ability to do this, but I'd, I am excited for those who do. Um, if you have a little a little area where you can start a garden, if you, um, you know, I guess I could a little home garden and some pots, which I should maybe look into. But if you can grow your own food, that's awesome. Let's see some other naturopathic things. Hydrotherapy. I don't know if in, if you've heard of hydrotherapy, but it's basically using water as medicine. And there's some great things that are very immune supportive. Um, even very simple things like when you're in the shower, give yourself a rinse, like you're in hot water, give yourself a rinse with cold water and try to get the back and the chest to stimulate lymph lymphatic flow. There is actually a, one study that shows that gargling has been good and they did it with salt water. So like two to three times daily for 15 to 30 seconds, gargling and spitting it out. That doesn't seem to be harmful. So couldn't hurt. The idea is things lodge in the throat right so just clearing that out there is also nasal irrigation with a neti pod or like a xylitol spray um, which you can do daily especially if you're if you are having to go out for some reason making sure you do that to clear out the sinuses but i would i would make you know caution just make sure the water you're using is very clean and filtered and boiled don't just use it from the tap because there can be pathogens in the water and we don't want it, those going up to the, the brain, the nasal area. So I would just caution people to, if they're going to do that, which is a um, wonderful way to rinse the, the passages of pathogens, just make sure you look at a reliable source for a way to how to do that. I have a pos uh, one that's probably not very popular, <laughs> especially when everyone's home, um, but reduce your alcohol or limit your alcohol. Again, probably not what you were looking to hear, but alcohol can suppress the immune system all around, so it'll make you easier for, to catch something nasty. We're not just talking about whatever virus it is, right? So I would I would tell people to avoid or reduce if they, or, you know, avoid if they can. I think that would be my main naturopathic, like, go-tos. Start with those great immune-supportive lifestyle practices, and you're going to be, you're going to be doing very good for yourself. Thank you so much for those. I just was taking notes, and so I have my outline of things I need to do. And one last question. Because we we have to socially isolate, and many of us are stuck in our apartments or you know, are forcing ourselves to be stuck in our apartments or houses, what would you suggest there in terms of like meeting people and you know, still feeling connected to other people while we're isolated? Oh, I love that. Okay, well, of course, there's always FaceTime, Zoom, if you have it, Skype, uh, and and making those contacts daily, I think is really important, because I'm actually alone, sort of all the time right now, and not seeing my family, even though they live nearby. I'm just staying here and getting trying to get work done, working from home, working virtually. So I would I talk to my mom, at least or others in my family daily and we've been facetiming I, I i you know of all times it's at least we have all this technology now that allows that and i think it's also a good time to reach out to people that you haven't contacted in a while or haven't been in touch with a while like just check in and it's a good not that you need an excuse but it's a good reason too <laughs> i guess that's it that's our answer the technology will save us in this case. Yeah, that's. I would say I feel lucky that we have it, that we are able to work from home, that we are able to stay in touch with people when we can't see them physically. Yeah, we're very lucky. Thank you so much, Steph. That's great. Okay, my pleasure. You take care. All right, that was part one, and now we're moving on to part two, which was our original conversation that Stephanie and I had last year. We talk about Stephanie's journey from Stanford-trained lawyer to naturopathic doctor, uh, managing stress and behavior change, optimal sleep, listening to your body, and what we can do for optimal fertility. 
So enjoy. Okay, my next guest is a lawyer. She's a naturopathic doctor, and she has a wicked, wicked backhand that I've seen firsthand. Stephanie Berg, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Well, I am totally honored that you asked me to come on, and I'm excited to chat, to chat and talk about everything today. And I don't know about my backhand anymore because <laughs> I actually... <laughs> Up until like a week ago, I hadn't played tennis for, I think it was like 2013. So anyway, Why? Anyways, Why for so long? Kind of, uh, you know, I was just a little, it wasn't bringing me joy. And I guess we can talk about that a little bit more, you know, with our conversation. But yeah, to be honest, I, you know what? I felt like I put too much pressure on myself because I wanted to be as good as I was before. And I'm not because I don't play every day. And even just, yeah. So maybe I'll get back into it. But yeah. Yeah, the forehand's better now. <laughs> so Stephanie and I met many, many moons ago in college. Yeah, and we were both on the tennis team. And that's why, you know, I had to bear the brunt of that backhand. So <laughs> I remember it very well. But um, she's taken an amazing path since then. And uh, I, I just can't wait to learn more about what you're doing now, Steph. So my first question is, you know, you got your JD from Stanford Law School, you're working in business law, and then I see this notification from you, you know, on social media that, oh, you're planning to become a doctor and a naturopathic doctor. So tell me why, what inspired you to take that step in your career? Okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to give you the, the shorter version, but I don't think the law was ever a passion of mine. And while it fit many aspects of my personality, like I sort of could fall right into it. And, and actually, when I say that, I don't mean litigation. I quickly discovered that litigation was not my thing. So more of the contract drafting. And while it fit many portions of like my personality, I could do that. It was sort of like over the years, I just realized that I wasn't passionate about it. And I wasn't excited to get up and go to work. And there's that party line that you can just... Um, like you need to do what you have to do to earn a living, like go to work, put up with it and then, you know, do whatever you want to do on the weekends type of thing. And I was like, but that's the majority of my life at work. Right. And after about five years of doing that, and I, I actually tried different positions within the law. Um, at a certain point it was like, I was really, I was miserable and it wasn't anything in particular. It was just like, I wasn't, I felt like there was more that I was supposed to be doing. And um, at the same time, I actually went through like my own, it, the, the stress got to me and my unhappiness in the job got to me to a point where I actually um, had an emergency gastrointestinal surgery. I actually fully believed that it had to do with my stress and my unhappiness at the time. They did, you know, exams afterwards and like no one could figure out anything. And I really believe that from the bottom of my heart because I feel everything in my gut. But I was in the hospital and I saw a resident there and I was like, oh my gosh, I, I'm jealous. I want to be doing what he's doing. <laughs> At the time I discovered podcasts. So I love podcasts and I'm just so excited you're starting this because like podcasts are a passion of mine. And, um, Actually, it was through podcasts that I discovered my passion for health, which I felt like I already had, but it was like all I wanted to listen to was the podcasts about medicine and health. And there were starting to be a lot of them and nutrition. And then there was a podcast on um, by a naturopathic doctor, and she had a podcast called So You Want to Be an ND. I listened to and I was like, yes, I do. That is exactly what I want to do. It resonates so fully with me. I loved the philosophy of naturopathic medicine and I then started to, you know, I went down the rabbit hole and was Googling, where can I go to school? How can I learn how to do this? And every time I looked at it, I was just like, it's all I wanted to do. And I look back now and, and basically I gave notice and I figured out how to live in a, I had to go back and do pre-med requirements because I had never done those. So I figured out how I could get those done in a year and a half instead of two years. Um, and I 
got a room in a random person's house in Washington so that I could do this and went to a community college for a quarter so that I could then go to best year's post back program. And I look back on it and I was just like, Oh my gosh, like, what was I thinking? <laughs> or like, how did I do that? I, I honestly had no fear at the time. I really didn't. I was just, it was like, I had to do it. And I don't know how else to describe it. But I look, I look back on it. And I'm like, whoa, that was sort of gutsy and risky. But there was nothing going to stop me. And so but I will say I was fortunate to be in the position that I could do that. So I completely understand, you know, that not everyone can just do that. So I feel very fortunate um, that I didn't have other obligations, but I just feel fortunate that at the time it was, I could make that decision. And so then I drove up to Kenmore, Washington and started school there and was there for a year. And then I um, applied and got accepted to Bastyr. Bastyr University is one of the seven accredited uh, naturopathic medical schools in the United States and Canada. And so I, they had opened in 2012, they'd opened a campus in San Diego. And so, um, after a year in Washington, I was ready for sunshine again. <laughs> and so I, um, I then applied and got in there and started there. And I spent the last four years studying naturopathic medicine there. Yeah, that's pretty much the journey. And it really was what I, I'm so excited to talk on your podcast because it really was all based on like passion. And I wanted to pursue my, I wanted to like design my life to be able to live in a way that really resonated with my values. And yeah, exactly. To live in a way that resonated with my values and how I wanted to live my life. Yeah, it truly started with your body, right? With your gut and then the surgery, and then when I listened to you talk about how you had no fear when you were jumping through all these hoops and you were so drawn to a field, it's like your body was literally telling you, yes, this is right, there's nothing to fear. Yeah. And I'm sure your training was not easy. I know you guys do a lot of clinical practice, right, while you study. Could you tell us a little bit more about that um, on how you know, naturopathic doctors are, are prepared in that way? Oh, totally. I love to talk about this because a lot of people don't know even what naturopathic medicine is. So I definitely, I love to talk about this. So basically naturopathic medicine or naturopathic doctors are, we're trained as primary care doctors, but what makes us different or unique is our philosophy and our focus. So the naturopathic medicine is based on like six core principles or a naturopathic philosophy. And basically the gist of it is our goal is prevention of disease, treating the root cause, the underlying cause of symptoms, or not just, not just band-aiding the symptoms and addressing the whole person. Let's see, there's six of them. Let's see if I can remember them all. Uh, the main, one of the main things we focus on is the belief in the body's inherent wisdom and ability to heal. So that would be, you know, basically if we remove the obstacles to cure the things that are getting in the way of the body's ability to be optimally healthy. So like not getting enough sleep, um, eating a poor diet, not getting enough exercise, that sort of thing, then we can allow the body to, to heal. And sometimes we need to do things to help it along the way. But the belief is that the body really wants to be healthy. Um, we focus on prevention as the best as the best form of cure. So that would be addressing things like way before they happen. For example, diabetes. If someone has um, a blood glucose level that's 125, but the cutoff to, is 126, we're not going to be like, oh, sure, go, you know, keep doing what you're doing. You're fine. The goal is to really take a, an approach that tries to prevent disease from happening. So you're not caught with something way down the line. And I guess along with that is another one that's, you know, treating the root cause, like I talked about. So if you don't address the root cause and you just band-aid a symptom, while well, symptom management is important to allow someone to make the changes they need to to really get at the root cause, our job as doctors is what we're trained to do is really be a detective and find what caused their disease in the or their health conditions in the first place and then work with them to address those causes. So you're one, don't it doesn't get more serious down the line and while well, pharmaceutical medications are appropriate and needed in many cases, we don't just want to 
be taking a medication we don't need to take if we could really just get more sleep or figure out ways to improve our ability to fall asleep. Right now I'm thinking of like sleep drugs. <laughs> um, another uh, philosophy is to, we try to treat the whole person. So that would be looking at mind, body, spirit, genetic factors, this whole unique person in front of us, and then developing a treatment plan based on their unique compilation of things that are contributing to their health. Um, and actually, this is actually one of the things that I think is the most, that I love the most, where you're not just giving cookie cutter protocols to everyone because everyone's situation is different. And then first do no harm. That's a really important thing. So we, our therapeutic order, what it's called is we want to start with the least invasive, least toxic, most natural, like it's not everything natural, safe, but most um, least harmful therapies to try to do what we need to do, like address the underlying cause and, and prevent, you know, disease and, and obtain optimal health. So that would be like starting with the obstacles to cure. If something they're doing that they could easily fix would solve a problem, we're not just going to give a medication. That's like higher up on the therapeutic order. Let's see, what am I missing? Oh, doctor's teacher is another one of our, our values and principles, philosophies. We want to basically empower the patient to be able to make changes on their own. And so we partner partner with them so that they understand you know, understand how to prevent disease and take care of themselves too, because we just don't want to be the the one they have to come back to anytime they you know need to do something. I think those are the main yeah. ones. Yeah, I mean, in many ways, like I think of my father who had to have an emergency heart surgery a couple of years ago, and that was a big shock for many of us because he was super healthy, exercised all the time. We thought he ate very healthy. But watching him go through that process and you know being there by his side and seeing how they treated him, it was almost like he was a robot and they were fixing his parts. I don't know if that makes any sense. Like when you say treating the symptoms, like that's the first thing I thought about. And it just struck me as lacking in so many ways. And so when you're talking about all these principles of saying that the body has inherent wisdom, focusing on prevention, seeking the root cause, listening to someone's spirit as well as their body, and you know, looking at their entire lifestyle. It strikes me as such a healthier way to treat someone, but also a much harder way, right? Because I'm sure people are used to just getting pills, right? Let's face it. As opposed to being told something like, hey, you need to sleep an extra hour a day or you need to clean up your diet. Those are behavioral things that maybe mentally people agree with, but in practice are very hard or I would think are harder to do because they involve habit change and lifestyle change. And so, yeah, I, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that or is it not harder? Is that just an assumption I'm making? No, I have so many, so many. And I think you were on that is exactly that's exactly it first of all i'm sorry to hear about your dad oh thank god he recovered and uh he's doing well now you know um and yeah we're like we're lucky he was able to get care the care he needed but man that that experience will never leave me seeing see, seeing that happen yeah yeah so i think there's definitely a time and a place for the emergency medicine for, I guess, what we'd call conventional allopathic medicine. If you're in a car accident, you don't want to go see a naturopathic doctor. Here, you know, like, don't, please don't come see me. <laughs> I'll go to the hospital. <laughs> and so, like, definitely time and a place for all that. But with chronic disease, I think that's where we really shine. And I think, but I think you are totally right. I think a lot of people go through the system and they're like that was not a fun experience like I was treated like a robot but I guess in a certain sense like that is their job in that situation like they're just yeah. trying to save your life in that moment if you need that that's where you go but then it once you're out of that position like for your dad once he's out of that position 
then he needs somewhere else to go to help prevent it from happening again, right? So that's where we, that's where I think we come in. And I, I often describe it as we're definitely not trying to replace allopathic medicine or medical doctors, naturopathic doctors. We, I feel like we work best as part of an integrative team with the typically regular medical team, the MDs, DOs, um, and then also other integrative healthcare providers like acupuncturists, physical therapists, chiropractors, all that. I feel like we work really well as part of an integrated integrative team. But I think what you hit on is that the lifestyle changes are it's not easy to get to get people to to get on board because we are so trained, especially in the United States and likely Canada. I don't know what it's like in Saigon or in Vietnam, but we're so trained here. People are so trained that you get a pill to just get rid of your symptoms. And the therapies that I'm using, while I, I while I can do things to get rid of your symptoms to make it easier for you to make the change, a lot of the treatments, they rely on the patient to make the hard changes. So you're going to have to eat better. You're going to have to... Uh, get in bed earlier if you're not sleeping. Like a lot of things exactly, it's it's hard to get people on board. And even when you come to a naturopathic doctor, they want a supplement to get rid of whatever's going on. And while supplements I completely think are, and pharmaceutical medications are completely appropriate at the right time for the right reason, you can't out supplement your way out of a poor diet. <laughs> And it's, it's really hard to get people to get on board with that. Depends on where you're, where we're working. Oftentimes, though, people who come to see naturopathic doctors are sort of more ready for that. But still, it's still not easy. And I know the first time I saw a naturopathic doctor, I didn't. I felt like I, I was like, well, where's the supplement? Like, <laughs> you know, why didn't you give me a, an herb for that? And sometimes they're necessary, but sometimes they're not always appropriate. So I think you completely. You completely the nail on the head. The other thing I failed to mention when in your to your first question is the training that we get, um, because I think that's really important for people under to understand. Regulation for naturopathic doctors is state by state, so actually only twenty two states, and then Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia currently license naturopathic doctors in the United States. All of the regulations are state by state. So what we can do in one state may be different than what we can do in another state. It's all very political. But people here in California, if they like take a course online, they are still technically allowed to use the word naturopath. And so the only title protection that we have in California is against or is the use of the word naturopathic doctor or doctor of naturopathic medicine. So if you want to look for someone who's attended and accredited university for your program, all the training, um, passed a licensing exam is licensed by the state. Then you want to look for a doctor of naturopathic medicine or naturopathic doctor. So a lot of people are confused about the training we get. So it is a four year accredited, um, naturopathic medicine, medical school. And there are only seven of them in United States and, and Canada. So it's uh, four years. We learn all the same biomedical sciences as MDs and DEOs. So that would be like your physiology, your biochemistry, pathology, all of that. And then the difference is we don't do hospital rotations. We don't go through the rotations like in an emergency medical center type of thing. Although we can if we go out of our way to do that. But what we do is learn botanical medicine, homeopathy, uh, nutritional medicine, uh, therapeutic nutrition, counseling, physical medicine. So we learn all those and then we, all of the schools generally have naturopathic medical clinics on site or nearby. And so I have, I don't remember the exact number, but it's like 1200 plus hours of clinical rotation training at school. So where the last three years I saw a patient in a clinical setting and under the supervision of our naturopathic doctor trainers and these supervisors. And then I also have had to do, um, which was really cool, preceptorship hours with naturopathic doctors and MDs and any other healthcare providers outside of school. And then at the end, which I just took in, in August, we have to pass a three-day exam 
it's patient case after patient case, like page long cases. Um, and then it's all sorts of questions that cover pharmaceutical medications because they're trained in pharmacology and drug herb interactions because we have to know both how to prescribe if we there is something we need to prescribe. And then also like, oh gosh, they're taking this medication. We shouldn't give them this herb. So it covered the pharmacology, the botanical medicine, nutrition, or diagnosis. I mean, like, you know, what does this person have? What, what would you do to work them up? And then all of the various treatment modalities we learn. So basically, after after going through that, it was seven weeks waiting nervously. And I, you know, you get the results. And then I applied for to my licensure. So that's sort of the process. So people know we're not just like, it's not just an online program. We, you know, yes. go through the whole thing. It gives a little more validity. Naturopathic doctor is a key thing to search for, right? Um, yes. And gosh, that's so much training. And one question I had, you know, listening to you talk about the principles and, and what you're learning, what you've learned, is how do you address a patient's um, spirit, as you say, or, or mental well-being, right? So in your case, if we looked at Stephanie, four years ago or five years ago, when you had this huge pain in your gut, you don't know what it is. How would you talk to someone like that, right? If you can't find a physical diagnosis. Totally. So usually the first appointment that we have with the patient is actually very long. This is, sorry, when you were mentioning something where you said it's almost harder to treat this way. Our model is actually much longer patient visits. Like, so you're getting generally an hour to an hour and a half for the very first visit. And we ask you a ton of questions. So even starting things from like, how was your birth? You know, were you, did you have a vaginal birth? That was your, did anything, what's in your mother's history, your father's history? You know, we like go pretty far back and we want to get, uh, we ask you all the questions about, you know, what's going on in your life? What are your stressors? Well, you know, what are you eating on a daily basis? If they're having any conditions, of course, we ask, okay, when did it start? Tell me more about it. All of those, those questions. We also want to know who are you living with? Like, do you have a healthy, healthy, really, do you have healthy relationships in your life? Do you enjoy your job? Yeah. Where do you, do you, you know, what's your self care? What are you eating? Do you drink water throughout the day? Do you sleep? So we're asking a ton of questions and, and oftentimes people will have them fill out in depth forms ahead of time so we can get a better idea and get to know them a little bit more. And then once we develop that relationship in the first visit, I often tell people like, okay, this first visit, just be ready. I'm going to ask you a lot of questions and maybe based on stuff I read in your forms or, you know, whatever you tell me. And it's really their opportunity to share their history and their unique story with me. And then um, once I have all that information, then I can make more informed decisions about, what, okay, what do we do next? Um, oftentimes, we'll need to do lab testing. I'll do a physical exam. And then I may or may not need to do lab tests, like blood tests or uh, saliva tests. There are lots of gas uh, GI tests now that we can do. And naturopathic doctors are trained, like, and we and I fully believe that a lot of health be begins in the gut. Anyways, we do a lot of them. We we'll, may do a lot of tests, and then once we have the results of those tests, the patient will come back, and then we can look further into what's going on and and develop a treatment plan unique to that per, that patient but in terms of your question sorry i go off on a tangent about really how do we address that mind spirit aspect i think it's really listening to the patient's story both in that initial visit and then as they're progressing in order to determine what it is for that patient and it may or may not be something spiritual or it could be something religious spiritual but it may or may not be um, we do ask about spiritual practices. You know, we have a detailed, detailed intake. So I guess it's it's really hard to say. It just depends on what we get and really listening to their initial story. And I think that that's something we we're trained to do to try to listen and try to ask the right questions and let them talk. Yeah, I mean, in a way, it sounds so revolutionary yet common sense that when you would see your doctor, 
your doctor would get to really know you, like not just that your arm is hurting, but how you live and and what you're doing and what your day is like and what community you live in, all this stuff. I imagine maybe doctors 200, 300 years ago thought that way, maybe because, you know, everyone, yeah. they know everyone in their village. I mean, it, it, it just makes so much sense. And as you were asking all those questions, I was thinking, I can't remember any doctor asking me any of those questions. <laughs> so maybe, you know, that in itself is such a difference. Yeah. I think that many people listening to this podcast, you know, have to deal with a lot of stress, right? Because we're not only creating something new, we're also forming a new identity. Like in the same way that you went from lawyer to doctor to healer, right? Like we're trying to do something new, something different than our previous path was. And it's not always easy to see if you're succeeding on that path or whether things are working out. There's a lot of basic, basically, there's a lot of ambiguity that we have to deal with and isolation. And so I'm wondering if you've come across patients like this, or you have any naturopathic principled tips to give us to maintain our our health and energy so we can do our best work. Totally. Okay. Can I say two things about two of the comments you made before? Yes. <laughs> okay. Something you said reminded me of a patient I saw yesterday who uh, came in with eczema. And she was in her 30s, and she just had started to get eczema for the first time. And it's, a new, it's more common to see it start in younger individuals, even as babies, but not uncommon. I mean, not it's not unheard of, obviously, to have it at late, start later. But she was, went to her dermatologist and was given a strong steroid cream to make it go away. And it totally worked. It made it go away as long as she was using the cream. But then as soon as she stopped, it came back. So I was like, okay, well, this is where naturopathic medicine comes in. We have to get to the root cause. And you were talking about the intake and the detailed intake. And I was like, the first thing I went to is, I was like, okay, are you filtering your shower water? And she's like, oh, no, you know, she just moved to a new city. And she's like, oh, yeah, my shower water is brown. And I was like, okay, let's start with that. Like, here's my favorite shower filter. Like, go with that. And so it's not even like, I mean, it's just simple things sometimes. And I'm hoping when I hear from her that that, I mean, we did, I had made a lot of other suggestions, but none of them were, they were all very basic lifestyle diet, dietary suggestions, like as a trial and the shower filter and changing her products she was using were the three basic ones. Nutrition. You also mentioned how it's based on probably a unique approach. And I completely agree 100%. I really don't think there's one diet. Different. I think there are some things that stay constant. I think whole food is best. Reduce the processed foods, reduce the fake foods. If you have no idea what an ingredient is on a label, probably best to avoid it. Avoid the trans fats, that sort of thing. I think there's like definitely commonalities. But then beyond that, I think there's so much we don't know and so much we're learning about genetics and gut health because now they're learning so much about the microbiome and microbiota and how we're all born different flora based on our mother's microbiome. And I mean, there are some companies that claim to tell you what you should eat based on, you know, taking a sample of your stool and, and looking at your microbiome and looking at the bacteria there. I've heard that they may or right now, just based on the research, it may or may not be so valid. I hear mixed reviews, but, and I think that's just only because we don't know everything about the gut health, you know, the gut flora right now. So anyways, I do think there's an individualized diet for people with the basic premises of this, like whole food, unprocessed, best to eat how it's from nature rather than from a box or can when you can avoid it. And then stress. Okay. I feel like you're totally right as an entrepreneur or as someone going down this new path, 
it's so easy to lose yourself in doing that and be isolated. And while it's really hard to do, um, I think in terms of isolation, one of the things that I is addiction to social media. And I think it's really nice to have and important. And oftentimes now for entrepreneurs, it's required, which is good and bad. I mean, I just, but sometimes I think it, people can go overboard where everything they do, they're recording or using, I, I mean, I'm, I'm so bad with the tech stuff. I, I'm just learning how to use Instagram and I've never even used Snapchat. So I'm not one to talk, but I know that you have to do that now to market yourself. I think you, there, there has to be a healthy balance. And I think one way to do that is just to monitor social media use. And again, these are the things that it's like, these are hard to do. It's addictive and it's just part of the part of the culture now. I think you also have to make sure to keep those real face-to-face relationships. And if it requires planning them out, then you know, you need to do that. I think that's what I would say with in terms of isolation. In terms of keeping yourself healthy overall, keeping that balance is so important. And it's really, really hard. But I think it's especially hard for people who are pursuing their passions because they love what they do and they want it to, to succeed so much and so badly. And You're almost like so tied to outcomes sometimes too, right? Oh my gosh, yes. Completely. Completely. And I think that's, you need to also enjoy the process. While you may not be as tied to outcomes, might help with that balance. I think that most people, like in my shoes, are they're quite aware of their bad habits, um, and then it's and it's just a matter of changing them, right? But if it was so easy, everyone would do it in a snap. But to live with that kind of oh, I know I should be say going to bed earlier or eating these whole foods. And then you find yourself not eating whole foods. You find yourself eating really bad foods. Even though deep down, you know, oh man, I know I don't want to live this way. And I know that in the long run, changing these aspects of my lifestyle will pay many more dividends. So that's actually the next question I wanted to ask you is, in our modern medical system, we want to see someone get a pill or get a surgery or just just fix it. Just fix it. Fix it. Fix it fast. And I would imagine that as a naturopathic doctor, you're dealing with longer timelines. You know, you see someone, they're going to have to change their shower head, fix their diet a little bit, fix their skincare products or whatever. And then hopefully things are, are better. But that takes time, right? As opposed to putting on a cream and then it disappears, like uh, a <laughs> eczema disappears. How is that built into the way you treat people? Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. Our timeline is is a lot longer, and we make that clear from the outset. So it's generally like you know you're not going to be cured after the first visit. Maybe if you're in real pain, we're going to help. We're going to try to do something to help you get out of that, so you can actually make the lifestyle changes. It's really developing that partnership, so we can go through the process and it's a longer process, but the hope is that by taking this longer process with multiple visits, and it's usually like you said, yeah, it's multiple visits. So it'll be this first one. We do that, the history and the deep, the deep dive into what's going on for this patient and then developing a treatment plan, which the length of that depends on what's going on with them. It's usually like, okay, I'm going to give you these things to work on right now Um, may include herbs, may include homeopathy, in addition to the lifestyle changes, nutrition stuff, supplements, just depending on the on the unique individual, and then come back in X number of weeks based on you know, what we give them to see how you're doing. And maybe they've gotten so much better, and they've made all the changes, and we're done. You know, you could, it, it could be as simple as that, like, maybe it was really just their diet. And that's all they needed to do because whatever they were eating was causing severe GI distress. Or it could be a much longer process where there's a little bit of change or no change at all. And we're like, okay, we need to either revamp the plan or make a small tweak. So, but it is a much longer process. But the hope is that by going through this longer process, you're one, getting to the root cause. 
so that they don't keep suffering after we get through this. And two, that it's really like a longer, it's, it's a cure, a cure in the sense that it's prevention and it's getting them to be in a place of optimal health and to be empowered to be able to stay that way. And then to just not have to rely on us, but come see us then if anything ever, ever they need us again. And I think the lifestyle changes, it's really hard to do. And I know from personal experience, like you said, I know the things that I'm not doing right now. I totally know them. And I'm I'm my own worst patient. I'm completely my worst patient. So I can tell people to do this in the hopes that they do it. Because I have done it in the past. And so I know I can do it where I've gotten myself in bed. My thing is getting myself in bed. And it's because I just, I want to get more done at night. I feel like I haven't done enough. I want to get more done. And even though I may be tired, I push myself to stay up. And we can talk about sleep because I think sleep is huge. And so I, it's, it's my work. It's my thing where I know I'm not doing a good job. But I continue, I continue not to make good decisions. So when I talk about it, it's it's not like I don't know it's you know, it's not easy. But I will but I will still tell everyone that they should do it because they need to have that in order to be able to make the change. Like if you if your why is like for me I'm I'm really trying to get my why. <laughs> my my why really is that I need to be awake in the morning and the longer I can be awake at night, like the harder it is to get up in the morning and I want to get up at five 30. Right. So anyways, I think it's really about finding your why, you know, like why deep down, why do you want to be healthier? Like, do you want to be able to thrive in your business? But you can't do that if you're tired and you can't get up in the morning. Like, so it's once you do that, I think sometimes it makes it easier to make the changes. And I think when someone gets a little bit of momentum, like that, the, I think the hardest, well, the hardest part is the very beginning of it. Like that first night you're going to get yourself in bed on time or those first meals where you're like, Oh, I really want that whatever food. And, but I'm not going to have it. I'm going to have my vegetables and it, that sort of thing. But then you, once you get in a routine, and you see results. So you're like, oh, I actually feel so much better the next day because I got into bed or I, oh, my, my gut doesn't hurt or I'm having better bowel movements after, you know, a week of eating better food, then I think it makes it much easier to stick with the changes. But it's really that, that those first changes that are the toughest, I think. And yeah, I mean, could you yeah spend a couple of minutes talking to us about sleep, like general ideas or general principles for for a good night's rest? Oh, so okay, so important. And there's so much research now about sleep. There's some really cool podcasts about sleep. If you just search sleep, there's there's um, a guy named Matt Walker, I think, who has one, and I listen to him. And then um, oh, I'm blanking on the other one but I've heard him speak and he, he studies circadian rhythm and I'm sorry, I can't remember the name. That's okay. I'll ask you about it later and then we can, we'll link to it in the show notes for sure. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Anyways, there's so much research coming out about the importance of sleep for brain health, for, I mean, things you wouldn't imagine such as metabolism, weight and ins- like insulin, it changes your insulin sensitivity. Uh, sleep is the the time where your brain detoxifies. Basically it has its own lymph system called the glymphatic system. And it's during sleep that you basically get rid of the debris from the day. So they're linking it to even things like Alzheimer's and, you know, dementia later in life. Like sleep is so important. And I think it's one of the hardest things for people to get because our, especially American Western culture, I'm a workaholic. It's sort of a badge of honor. I don't sleep is a badge of honor. And that's how I was trained. That's like, really like, oh, oh, I only got four hours of sleep. Like people say that with this sort of, it's, you know, I work really hard. I only slept four hours. Or, so I think, I think it's one of the hardest things to get. And I think it's one of the most important things to get. In terms of sleep quality, we really want to maintain a good circadian rhythm. And, and basically what that means is on a daily cycle, 
Our bodies are designed to be up during the day and to go to bed at night. So we have a spike in cortisol in the morning that gets us up. And then throughout the day, it and there's a, like a, pretty, spi- a pretty big spike that says, okay, time to get up. And then throughout the day, it decreases. And as the cortisol is decreasing, later in the day, our melatonin is supposed to be increasing. Melatonin is basically what gets us to sleep. And it's produced by the pineal gland in the brain. And it's produced in response to light amongst other things. So uh, when it gets dark outside, our melatonin is supposed to increase. Cortisol is supposed to decrease. Melatonin is supposed to increase. But there are things that inhibit this natural cycle. So for example, you push yourself to stay up longer and longer. You may have a a rise in uh, melatonin and you may be getting sleepy, but if you push yourself to stay up past that, you're actually going to get this disruption in your cortisol. You may get a spike in cortisol and then you're that prevents your melatonin production and inhibits it. And then you're not going to get optimal sleep. So the idea would be to get up at the same time, go to bed at the same time every day. So your body understands what it's supposed to do to get first thing in the morning. And then as it gets darker throughout the day, you're going to reduce the amount of light you see. So you get this optimal uh, melatonin spike. The problem is, is that now in the modern world, we're surrounded by light throughout the day. So basically our bodies are like, oh, they have no idea what time it is, right? So like right now I'm standing in super bright light and it's seven o'clock at night, but I do this all the time. I know I shouldn't, but I do this all the time. Um, And so my body does not really know what time it is, although it's getting darker outside because we had daylight savings. So it was really fascinating. That happened a few days ago. And honestly, I was like, oh, I just want to go to bed. Why is that? I'm so tired. So one of the things I would recommend, especially for entrepreneurs and people who are probably on their computers a lot or their electronic, their phones, is try, if you can, to reduce that at night after it gets dark. Really try. If you can't do that, then you can get um, technology. There's something called Flux to reduce the blue light emitted from your screens. And it automatically will reduce it as the sun goes down or as it's, you know, supposed to be stuck in time. Um, the other thing you can do, oh, I think I have these. Hold on. I do. And I always forget to wear them. Oh, I see I have them next to my desk so I can wear them, but I always forget. You can buy amber-colored blue blocking glasses, and they're really not very expensive on Amazon. And you, if you put them on after dark, I probably look really great here with my glasses on, but... You put them on after dark to reduce the blue the blue light. They block the blue light. And there are studies that have shown that it actually really does improve sleep quality. So it's like an inexpensive investment as long as you remember to wear them. And the, the few times I've worn them, I actually do notice that I get sleepier in a good way because it's time. Um, and then once you get into the bedroom, there are lots of suggestions I have for like optimal sleep environment. So ideally we wouldn't have any electronics in the bedroom. Okay. Just so there's no like Wi-Fi signals running around and. Oh my gosh. Yes. That's another, we can get to that. So yes, no electronics in the bedroom for multiple reasons. One, because of the EMF stuff Two. Um, because of any, a lot of times it'll produce ambient light. So we just want to, we want to get rid of all ambient light, like even little green lights on, uh, on an alarm clock or red lights on an alarm clock, because our bodies, our eyes, even if they're closed, like we're actually, we can, our bodies can sense it. So I don't, you know, don't go crazy. Okay. I have in my bedroom, I have a dimmer switch that I guess I could put black tape over, but there's a little green light and I don't do it, but I could, and probably maybe and get better sleep. But you know, if you have lights from the outside, black out the, see if you can, you know, shut the curtains or however you can get it as dark as you can. And some people like to wear um, face masks or sleep eye masks to make it really dark. And then the right amount of noise. Some people like it really quiet. Some people like some ambient noise. Let's see. So that would, that would be the light stuff. And then what was I going to say? Oh, the EMFs. I didn't know a lot of about that until oh, like a year ago, but I've been learning more and more. And I watched a telesummit on it with lots of really educated PhDs and doctors. And to be honest, it scared me. It really scared me. And I was like, oh, shoot. 
like <laughs> I slept with my cell phone next to my head, not on airplane mode for so many years. And I've been sleeping. And then I used it in airplane mode as my alarm clock next to my bed. But now this, after I watch this, I unplug my Wi-Fi router every night and make sure my phone is still on airplane mode because unfortunately in the air where I'm living right now in a building with multiple people, like I still have the Wi-Fi all around from all of my neighbors and it drives me crazy now that I know all of this, but you know, you got to live in the real world. So I just do the best I can and I make sure my electronics are off and my Wi-Fi is off. And while it's a pain, I think there's so much that we don't know and other countries not in like the EU and, and many others, they don't allow so much that we allow now and they take a more preventative approach or more like, let's not find out what happens and then outlaw it outlaw. Let's do the testing first. So anyways, reduce the EMFs at night because it has been shown to disrupt sleep according to the research I listened to or the people I listened to as well as many other things. But to just reduce it at night, related to that, although not related to sleep, don't use your cell phone against your head or put it in your bra or put it in your pocket. Keep it away from your body. Um, let's see, what else about sleep? Oftentimes you'll hear, you know, don't eat three hours before bed so that you're not digesting food in your sleep, which can disrupt sleep. Some people, if there's too long of a period of time between dinner or your last meal and when you sleep, they can have a hypoglycemic episode in the middle of the night, which will spike their cortisol in order to get their liver to release glucose to raise their blood sugar, and that will wake them up. And so for those people, it's probably a good idea, like maybe to have a little snack, protein, healthy carb, healthy fat before bed just to keep that steady glucose level. Just depends on the person. If you want to do other things for self-care, it would be, you know, maybe you have a routine where you, this one I don't do, but I think it would be really nice. Although I sort of have a, a before bed routine, but just say like every night, an hour before bed, I'm going to turn off my electronics and take a hot shower with, you know, my essential oils. I don't know, whatever it is, or read, a, you know, read a, relaxing book, listen to a meditation, whatever it is that gets you in the mood to sleep. That's a lot of great tips. And I mean, is there a certain length of time, like seven, eight hours is, is a number thrown out a lot? Or is that is it different for everyone? Um, that is the number that's thrown out a lot. And that is the number that I keep hearing from these people that trust. Although there is a lot of talk about people having different chronotypes or sleep chronotypes like some people are more night owls and I definitely know for myself I'm more of a night owl although I think it's more I think I could change that if I made better decisions just because the world doesn't run on my schedule <laughs> um, but I think the seven to eight hours and then I, I do I have heard and I do believe that you get better sleep before midnight so trying to bed, like ideally maybe 10 o'clock you do, I, I feel it personally. And I have heard that a lot by reputable sources. I can't tell you why that is, although there may be research to say why. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is probably super unscientific, but I think of kids, right? I think of um, how our kids sleep because they go to sleep super early. Uh, all parents know if your kids are on like a regular sleep cycle, they're much easier to deal with during the day and they have more energy and they're less grumpy, but they're sleeping so many hours and they have that regular schedule and it's like clockwork. And they're, and they're learning super fast. We almost have to think of ourselves as our own kids. <laughs> and like, all right, Darren, you know, enough of your crap. It's time for you to go to sleep. Like, put the electronics away. You know, it's the same thing, right? We do it with uh, people we have to care for, so. Yes, we have to be our own parents. Oh my gosh, you're so right. We have to we have to parent ourselves and be good parents to ourselves. I, oh my gosh, you couldn't have said it better. And also, I think you're 100% right that sometimes it's really important and neat to look at how kids, natu children naturally do things because that's what their bodies are designed to do. And we don't do that often. We 
totally live outside of that. Um, so like children usually eat when they're hungry, stop when they're full. We might be eating, like be like mindlessly eating, right? And just like, oh my gosh, why did I just eat all that? Or or I was full 10 minutes ago. Why am I still eating? That sort of thing. Like they totally listen to their bodies and they sleep when they want to sleep and they eat when they, their body tells them to eat. You know, I, I think you're totally right on that. Yeah, and, th and that's actually my next question. Like, how do we tune into and listen to our bodies more? We hear a lot about meditation as one way to do it, to be still, to focus on our breathing. But I mean, a big part of this podcast is really trying to help us access the wisdom of our bodies in the same way that kids listen to their bodies and then take those cues and then, and then answer those cues. But we're sometimes so divorced from them because of society and our habits light <laughs> lights and screens I, I feel like this is a really important part of what you do too i would think seeing yourself as someone you have to take care of and listening to what your body's telling you and how you're feeling to certain things yeah no completely and part of it is because our therapies don't give you immediate results oftentimes it may be really subtle things that you notice yeah. I mean, one example that comes to mind is what we're eating, right? If someone comes in and it really seems like something they're eating is causing their issues, we may suggest something. You can do food allergy or food sensitivity testing. So food sensitivities are delayed reactions, so not like you eat a peanut and you have an anaphylactic reaction, but more your body creates antibodies to those foods and it may show up three days later as brain fog. And so we'll often tell people, okay, you, it just seems like you may be having a reaction to something you're eating. So maybe we want to do a very time limited, what we call an elimination diet. And we remove the most, the, you know, certain six or seven foods that people are usually sensitive to, or most commonly sensitive to. And we, you know, we remove those for four weeks and see how you feel. But what we say is you really have to tune into your body because after that period of time when you're not creating those inflammatory molecules to those foods, it may not just be digestive symptoms that improve. You may not see it there. Like maybe your bowel movements were fine to begin with. You're having great GI function. Maybe it's your eczema clears up or maybe it's acne clears up, or maybe you have more energy, or maybe it's your brain fog, or maybe your joint pain you know, gets better. And it's just because of the way the body works when you have inflammatory, when the body creates antibodies to certain foods. The, there are several ways that it can trigger reactions throughout the body. One is called molecular mimicry, where the antibody is created to attack that certain food that you're sensitive to. But instead, it attacks another protein in your body that looks similar to that food. That's very common with things like thyroid, Hashimoto's, thyroid, autoimmune conditions. There are other ways too, just based because of inflammation in your body, lots of you know inflammatory molecules in your body, you're going to feel the symptoms throughout your body. A lot of people have heard now of intestinal permeability or commonly known as leaky gut. There are certain foods... And certain lifestyle choices like smoking, lots of antibiotics, um, gastrointestinal diseases, if you get like a parasite or an infection, lots of triggers, smoking even, that, like NSAIDs, very common medications that can trigger a leaky gut, they call it. And then foods you eat, which, you know, are not bad foods, they pass through the, the very thin intestinal lining. It's only one cell layer thick. It's usually designed to just keep out the bad stuff and let the nutrients in, right? But when you have tears in that GI tract because of these things, then the the body will form antibodies to them, and there you go. To answer your question, one example is we tell people to really try to tune into their bodies and even maybe track their symptoms using like a, a diary or like or a food diary where they're like, okay, here today I ate da-da-da and 
and I had this symptom or I had lots of energy or I did this. So keeping track of the symptoms, at least a start, and then people become more attuned to it and how they're feeling. And food may not be the only thing that causes their symptoms. So it's like listening to like, okay, what did I do? It's, it's sort of like this whole thing with biohacking. I was just about to go there. Exactly. And it's really like making a change. And the more scientifically you do it, like I just made this one change, but I didn't, I didn't like not get any sleep that night. And, you know, I just changed my food, for example, then you can really try to tune into your body. I guess I don't really have any specific things to say to like tune in but I think more it's just a process of learning to listen then go from there and then with that elimination diet to be more scientific about it after that four to six week period where we remove everything and that given the body a time to calm down if one of those foods is causing inflammation then when we reintroduce them we reintroduce them one at a time so that and then we'll like wait a few days to see if we have any response. And then if we don't, then like maybe that's a food we can we can have in our diet. I also am very sensitive to the fact that I don't want to create stress around diet and nutrition and unhealthy relationships with food. I'm very sensitive to that. So I think we also have to use something like an elimination diet in the right person. Right. Gosh, listening to, you know, to, to everything you've been saying for the past hour. I think there's so much potential for this sort of treatment. I don't know if you'd call it that or or medicine, behavioral and lifestyle medicine. And this idea of it's overwhelming in the sense that we have to look at the the whole picture of our lives to live with optimal health. Nothing exists in isolation is what I'm learning from what you're saying. And so in many ways, that's intimidating because maybe the thing, the problem I'm having, it could be food, it could be sleep, it could be my lifestyle. But at the same time, it's also empowering. It just takes more work, <laughs> right? I mean, I guess what I'm trying to get at is is like maybe in what, one day we're going to have technology that just tracks all these things. It tracks what we eat, tracks how we're feeling, our mood all the inner workings of the body that you know so well that I don't, but like all the different levels to be monitored and so forth. And then we'll be able to pick out, oh, it was that peanuts, right? That like made me feel this way. But until then, you know, it's really, like you said, it's just an exercise of paying attention. Yeah, maybe keeping that daily journal is something, uh, before you even mentioned it, I was thinking, yeah, this is something I can start to do how my body's feeling and and what I'm eating and sleep, like the basic stuff. Totally. And um, I don't mean to interrupt you, but like on the technology point, I completely think you're right that in like we will and we do now have the technology to be able to track things. But like with respect to sleep, although it's not, it's available to people, but some of it's expensive. I think maybe over time it will become less so. Some of it's free. But for example, a lot of people like the biohacking community to track sleep, there's lots of sleep trackers, one called the Aura Ring. And I don't have this, but it evidently it tracks like all aspects of sleep, like your quality, your quantity, when you were in REM sleep, all that stuff. So you can basically be like, okay, I got in bed at 10 o'clock this, you know, last night and got up at seven and it shows I have this many minutes or hours of REM sleep. And there's other technology like, I mean, tracking your steps during the day. For yep. women's menstrual cycles, yep. there's like all, a lot of um, apps for that. So it helps people track things. Right. So even if, yeah, so it helps you tune in to things so you can also take those to your doctor so they can help you really figure things out. There are like lots of other, like you said, apps to track things. Food, I mean, you can track your food on an app. You can track all of this with technology. Oh, and there's even, you know, there's even things that claim to tell you if you're sensitive to a food right on the spot based on your pulse or even just checking your pulse. You know, if your pulse increases significantly right after you eat a food, the understanding is that that indicates a sensitivity. It's exciting, but that also sounds like so overwhelming to me, like, you know, tracking all these things. Completely. Completely. You don't want to get lost in it either, right? (laughs) Yeah. I just want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your evening to be on the show, Steph. I've learned so much, and it's kind of like 
reshaping my thinking on, on how to move forward and observe myself as I try to live in an optimally healthy way. And sure, I feel like you're at the forefront of something that will become more normal in the future or more standardized in the future. Because we need naturopathic doctors when we're kids, before anything bad happens, right? If the whole goal of what you're doing or a big part of it is prevention, then that means that we have to reach these kids when they're kids, right? Before they become us with our bad habits. Uh, so, and they'll also be so much more self-aware of how their body works and how they can tune into their bodies and what they're feeling and know that that's just a natural process. Whereas I, I can speak for myself that, you know, I think I ignored my body for a long time. I just, I had to get something done or I had to make something happen. That, that was all that was important. Um, but I think I'm really shifting into, yeah, just trying to see my health from a very holistic point of view and trying to operate from very important first principles, like you're saying, like getting enough rest, eating whole foods and all those things. And, and then, but also observing, right, what's going on, just being aware, stepping outside myself for a little bit or being in myself. You know what I mean? It's, it's both. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. You, know, you said it, you said it so perfectly. And I, my, I'm the same way, like for so long, I completely ignored my body. And like when I was in law school, I went through, I went through pots oh of Mr. God. Coffee a day, like pots. One of my other passions and focuses is, um, you were talking about starting this as children. And I think that's so important so that, so that we're trained, like you said, to instead of trained to look for a pill to relieve a symptom, like if you have reflux after you eat, just take a Tums versus like, you know, oh gosh, maybe I should try to fix something or address what's causing that. So if we're trained from a young age to do that, like I completely agree with you that that's important. But one of my other passions in in addition to women's health, hormone balance, like thyroid health, GI health, is preconception health. And I think that there should be like five trimesters. And I think the, it's like the first one is preconception. And then you have trimesters and then there's the postpartum phase. But the preconception phase is so important because, and, and it's not just the mother's health, it's both the father and the mother because the sperm is half of the, half of the picture. And the three months before is key because it's generally like three to four months that it takes for the sperm and the egg to develop. So whatever you're doing, eating, exposed to in terms of like toxins, toxic chemicals, which we are surrounded by today, um, EMF, that's huge actually for men's sperm production. All of this stuff impacts the health of the sperm and the embryo and ultimately the child's start to life. And so I'm really passionate about preconception and for, you know, fertility, preconception, health and diet, lifestyle, all of that. Cause I think, like you said, it should start in childhood, but I think it should start even before they take their first breath and starts like really longer than three months. But ideally, like if you're going to make changes three months before. I mean, one more question. Is it fair to say that, you know, when you're helping uh, a man and a woman be optimally healthy at pre at the preconception phase or at that that first phase out of the five right is it fair to say that that style of living is their optimal style of living right if you're preparing your body to have a kid and you're ridding yourself of toxins and you're eating the right foods and you're doing all the right things like that is you know if you're the most fertile that is like the optimal state is it not or am I thinking about that wrong? No, 100%. And I think ideally, we would all live like that all the time. What's so interesting about making change, what's so interesting is when people are trying to become pregnant, let's say they're having a problem with fertility, or even they're not, and they want to start, start trying, people will make changes in their life that they won't make at any other time. Like they're like, Oh yeah, no, no, I won't drink alcohol. I'm not going to smoke. I am not going to touch anything. Like I'm not going to eat that food. Um, you know, I'm not going to, women give up their coffee, like 
all of these changes that people don't normally make at other points in their life when ideally you would live this way 100% of the time, even when you're not trying to become pregnant um, or trying to have a child and and you want to live this way ideally when the child is born because you don't want to expose them to all these things when they're smaller and their bodies are more prone to to active toxins and the impacts of these unhealthy foods and they're developing and you don't you know you want to have the healthiest environment for them to develop in so that you prevent all these problems later in life but so i think to the point of making changes maybe we should just say like live the way you would live if you wanted to have a healthy child yes (laughs) exactly like why i mean it, it goes back to the very start of our conversation people who are making these changes have a very strong why they want to give their, their child the best chance, right? Why can't we give ourselves the best chance? I mean, it's it's fantastic that we're, we, we're willing to sacrifice. And when we think of our progeny or we think of our kids, we think of other people. But what about ourselves, right? Why wouldn't we treat ourselves that way every day? I, I'd like to, yeah, let's end the conversation here. Stephanie, where can we find you? I know you have a website, naturopathicways.com. And... How else, if people want to learn more about or like see you for a consultation or, you know, are thinking about um, having a kid? Yeah. Where where else can they follow you? Awesome. Okay, so I have a website, like you said, www.naturopathicways.com. It is still a work in progress. There's lots of information there right now, but there will be even more in the future. Yeah, so www.naturopathicways.com. There you can find a link to information about me, how to work with me. I am right now practicing in Sherman Oaks, California, and I'm licensed in California, so I can only treat people in California. If you um, do want to work with me or talk with me, that would be the best place to get in touch. I'm also on Instagram at Dr. Stephanie, Dr. Stephanie Berg, although I do need to post more there. Thank you so much, St- Stephanie. This has been um, so great to catch up and to hear what you're doing. And I can literally feel your excitement and enthusiasm for this field and what a change that must be from you know your, your, your lawyer days. Although you still have those amazing skills, you still have those skills. But uh, I'm just so excited that you're excited about what you're doing and you have helped and you're going to help so many people. So thanks again. Oh, thank you so, 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 so much. And it really was a pleasure talking to you and you're a wonderful interviewer. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on whatever podcast app or platform you use. It helps more people find the show and I would sincerely appreciate it. Thanks again. And remember, you can find all the show notes links mentioned in this episode at upstartus.tv slash ace. That's A-S-E. Hope to see you over there to continue the conversation. Um, while I have you, I just have one more question because I know you specialize in, in, in hormone treatments, right? Like naturopathic hormone treatments. Is Am I correct with that? Yes, you are. Yeah. You are. So as a man who's getting older, <laughs> I guess um, I'm just curious to hear what you have to say about testosterone, because that's a, that's a word that's thrown around a lot in, in the circles I, I swim in. What's healthy testosterone and, and you know, how we can um, maintain that? Okay, cool, cool. Um, Sorry, I'm like well, using this as a personal personal consultation from you. <laughs> no, first of all, you don't look like you've aged at all. So um, I will say that. First of all, I would say the main daily lifestyle habits. You want to be getting good sleep. It really does make a difference for testosterone. You want to be getting good sleep. You want to be getting physical exercise. To increase testosterone, weight training is very important Um, In addition, you want to do your cardio, but you also want to do that weight training. And actually, lifting heavier is better for building testosterone. Fewer reps, but heavier load. And then eating the proper diet. So you don't want to you don't want to go overboard on protein, but you don't want to skimp on your protein either. And make sure you aren't 
you know, eating healthy whole foods, like, um, and protein doesn't necessarily mean meat. So there are lots of people who eat a whole uh, vegan or vegetarian diet, and there are lots of good ways to get your healthy, you know, proteins in. But just getting enough amino acids, I guess I should say. Reducing stress, reducing cortisol, because that also can Im- inhibit t- uh, hormone production because it all comes from the same molecule to begin with. There's a pathway to create your hormones. And the same one that creates cortisol also creates your testosterone. So you want to make sure you're you know, not super stressed and having healthy cortisol levels. So whatever you need to do to reduce your your stress. Stress is not a bad thing. We all have stress. It's actually finding ways to deal with our stress. So we're not constantly in a sympathetic state, if that makes any sense. There are supplements you can take for like muscle growth, like a lot of people or a lot of in the muscle building community, you can do like creatine, monohydrate, and there are specific kinds. I think it's called Creapure, which is the one that's researched there's some protocols where you do like a loading dose of 20 grams for a little bit and then you move to five grams per day. And ideally you take it right after weightlifting and away from caffeine and that can increase, you know, muscle growth for be good for sarcopenia. You do have to make sure it's in the right person. Well, I have researched and not seen any studies showing any harm from it, but you do have to watch like kidney function, for example. Uh, and then I would not recommend like a testosterone replacement for younger men because that can inhibit your natural production of testosterone. Unless you're dealing with someone who has a condition where they're not producing enough testosterone, which is possible, but that would be something you'd likely see at a much younger age and hypogonadism. And they would need, they would need help with that. And you do naturally decrease your testosterone testosterone production as you age. It's just natural, but there are things you can do like you need a healthy diet and weightlifting as you age and exercising and reducing your stress that will keep your testosterone levels at a higher level. In terms of testosterone replacement, there are, it's, it really should only be used in the right people and you need the proper testing. And if you're getting the testing, you have to do it at the right time of the day because your testosterone level is highest between the hours of 8 and 10 a.m. So you need to test then. And because test later in the day, it's going to look lower. And the doctor might be, oh, you're low testosterone. You're going to need testosterone replacement. And that's not really true because you looked at the lowest point in the day. So you need to test at the highest or at the 8 to 10 a.m. window. And also you need to get your free and your total testosterone tested. The free testosterone is the bioavailable testosterone that can get into the cells. You need to look at both numbers because you can have someone with like, they seem to have a low total testosterone, but their free bioavailable may be totally fine. So you need to look at the, you know, it needs to be the right person to replace. And then sometimes in the right person, you can give a precursor to testosterone, such as DHEA. And people can take that in the United States. It's not regu- like it's not a prescription medication. You can get it as a supplement. But in many other countries, it's regulated as a prescription medication you have to get as- from a doctor. So I guess those are some of the suggestions. But for you, I would say you look awesome. I saw on Facebook that you were doing like you had some group in the park. And I thought maybe you were doing like weightlifting or like exercise of some sort and then also your salsa dancing i think that's so cool so you're getting your exercise you're getting your time with your friends you're getting like that social bonding you're getting like a fun outlet like you just you rock (laughs) 